Yes, yes, yes. Hello and welcome to Unblock 2022. Uh, my name is Keith and I'm very, very happy to be here to talk to you about all things BuildKite and all things CICD. Um, but before we get on with the rest of the show, I'd like to start by acknowledging the traditional custodians of the land as of which I am streaming to you from today, uh, the Noongar people, and I pay my respects to elders past and present. So, BuildKite. Let's talk about it. Uh, Unblock 2022. We've got a jam-packed uh, conference for you, digital conference. It would be nice to see you in person, but uh, one day, one day we might get to hang out. I thought I would start today by talking a little bit about uh, what we've done this year. And then I'd like to talk a little bit about what uh, I've been playing with for the past couple of weeks. Um, uh, I started making Bill Kite eight or nine years ago. Um, you know, it, was a, it was a project of mine working uh, in, in between jobs, that was something I was passionate about. And uh, uh, I got to have a little fun doing some programming. And so recently I've just been sort of leaning back into having a little fun, experimenting with some code and some some ideas of what future Bill Kite stuff could be. So I'm gonna share a little, that with you. But like I said, 2022, big year. Let's, uh, let's, let's have a quick review of what we did. Test analytics. I always felt like everyone was ignoring the test suites. Um, you know, uh, these, these second applications that you spin up and you write, you put so much effort into uh, uh, writing these tens of thousands of tests, it becomes almost like a garden that needs uh, looking after a while. And the test suite often tells you information, but you just weren't listening to it. Hey, I'm getting slower. Hey, I'm getting more complicated. Hey, I'm using more CPU. Hey, I'm using more RAM. Hey, I'm less reliable. Um, and so we set out to build a product that would sort of start to capture that information and start telling you back some interesting stories about your test suite. We've already fixed a bunch of flaky tests in our test suite. And uh, I know that a lot of others are getting a lot of value out of it too. So if you haven't tried it yet, go check out uh, Test Analytics. We've also shipped some new ways for you to run your agents. Uh, a lot of you run your production workloads in Kubernetes. So it makes sense that your your build and test environment should mirror production as, as best as it, as it can. So spinning up agents in Kubernetes has been pretty useful. Uh, and also we you know a lot of you do uh, iOS builds and Mac builds. And so you can now spin the agent up automatically uh, up, up and down in your EC2 for Mac um, servers on, on Amazon. Uh, and so we see a lot of people use these things and if you haven't quite heard of them, uh, check them out. Um, we'll share the links with you either in the chat as you're watching this or after the show and you'll be able to uh, learn more about these two projects. We also have some great pipeline updates. Uh, we added uh, the ability to group steps together and treat them like a single unit um, and then have dependencies based off of that group. And we also added a new matrix stanza. Uh, so you can uh, define some, uh, a few dimensions of like, run this uh, run this step in uh, 386 uh, architecture and AMD 64, and it would explode a couple of combinations into lots of different steps. We became SOC 2 compliant. I'm not sure if you've ever gone through one of these things before in your job, but uh, a lot of paperwork, a lot of processes, a lot of stuff to get through, a lot of installing software on computers. It's been good. Um, I'm very happy we did it. It's definitely helped our security posture at BillKite level up. We can't forget the UI refresh we did. Uh, we, we pushed some new greens, some new reds and some new, new yellows and some new icons. This was a lot of work. The team spent a lot of time doing it. I'm very happy with how it came out. Um, BillKite hadn't seen a coat of paint in I think a couple of years. Uh, we were still having that old bootstrap green uh, uh, was still floating around for quite some time. So I'm pretty happy that we finally managed to change it. Um, and also it saw us bring a, a new set of tabs to the build page to help you find failures faster. Um, because we did some, we did the maths and you'd be surprised that basically but no one looks at a green build. Uh, no one looks at a build that's passed. Uh, they only really come to build kite when there's something wrong. So we try to make the build page serve that purpose first and foremost. So that's a bit of a review of this year. Uh, I'm very happy with the work we've just done. And, um, now I'd like to talk a little bit about something I've been thinking a lot about. I've been thinking a lot about stories lately um, and, and how stories can apply to the work that we do. It's a pretty bold statement, DevOps lacks storytelling, but I think it's quite true. There's context for sure. And storytelling is just context with a narrative. There is actually quite a lot of storytelling in the work that we do. Um, let's think about the, the hero's journey. Uh, there is some, a villain or some obstacle that a hero must overcome 
Um, we do that a lot of the engineering that we do. There might be a bug we're trying to fix, or maybe there's a slow page or some customer problem. There is some adversity we must overcome. And so I think there's always an interesting and exciting narrative to be made um, in the work that we do. But what I've found is that as we've journeyed more into the world of config as code um, and, and trying to push more things down into, in, into text files, um, we've lost some of the art of, of storytelling because I feel like storytelling is told in pictures and in, in, in shapes and in colors. Uh, people go to the movies to see a film. They don't like sit home and read a script. Um, you know, they listen to music. They don't read sheet music oh, unless you're in, in the business and what you do. Uh, but uh, uh, I think there is an opportunity for Bill Kite and for us as an industry to start pushing forward um, more storytelling in the things that we do. Speaking of stories, I know Pipelines 2015, I want to tell you about how they came around. I'd like to claim that I was some genius inventor and I did some uh, meditation and I thought, hmm, what could be a great feature for Build Pipe, Dynamic Pipelines? I'd love that to be the case, but it's not. Um, uh, I stumbled into it. I was in Prague at the time. I was traveling with my wife doing a bit of um, sightseeing and we came back to the uh, apartment we were staying in and I set out to try and solve the problem of, of config as code in Bilkai because bef at, at this time you had no way to define um, pipeline. The YAML didn't exist. You could only define pipelines via the UI. And uh, uh, I set out to try and solve this problem. But Bill Kite has this rule about not seeing your source code. You can't see the source code. So how do I add config as code to Bill Kite, but respecting that foundational principle? So I thought, hmm, you know what would be good? It, what if uh, uh, when the build started, it read a file from your repo, uploaded it to Bill Kite, and then we sort of um, uh, ran the build from that file. Great. So I set about making it. And you can see this pull request where I made it all work. And it was kind of cool. It just, it, it, it was pretty powerful. I was just uploading static files to BuildKite. Um, and uh, I sort of had solved the problem. You could now define your pipelines uh, as code in your repo. So what I did was I just started playing with what I had built. I had no real intention. No, once I had sort of solved the config as code problem, I just sort of sat back and thought, what, maybe I could use a dynamic file. What if I could generate this pipeline dynamically from a script? It doesn't have to be a static file. What if it came from a script? And so I started playing. And then I sort of discovered dynamic pipelines as a feature just through playing with the thing that I had wrote. And I had really given myself permission to play with the thing that I had built. Um, uh, uh, and I had a lot of fun and I discovered new ways of using BuildKite with dynamic pipelines. And that led into this whole, uh, other set of features around input steps that you could then um, get metadata out of and pass it into other commands. And then you could create these weird and wonderful, I created a choose your own adventure game in BuildKite. Uh, I'll link that in the chat as well, uh, uh, using dynamic pipelines and block steps. And it was because I, I gave myself just a second to sit back and think about what can I do with this? This could be fun. I had no real destination in mind. Um, uh, I just wanted to have fun with the thing that I had built. And so that's what I've been doing recently. I've been thinking a lot about storytelling in DevOps, um, specifically storytelling in pipelines. And then uh, with this permission to play uh, thing that I have for myself, trying to merge the two things together to see what comes out. So I'd like to show you uh, what I've been doing. Uh, here's a screenshot of Bill Kite. This is from one of our own builds internally. And um, uh, as you can see, we've uh, there's a bunch of steps here that run, we upload pipelines, we do some Docker image, we do a bunch of testing, uh, code coverage, and then we deploy to production if it passes. We use a continuous deployment methodology. So if the uh, build is green, then we push to production. Some of you may know about this next visualization that I'm about to show you. This is the DAG view. You may have seen this before. Uh, if you go to the build URL, um, uh, and then just add slash DAG at the end, you'll see it. And this is us uh, attempting to visualize the dependencies of the graph. What I've been playing with for the past couple of weeks is a new way to visualize this particular page. I was talking to someone at Bill Kite today and they say that um, part of a designer's job is to change how you think about something. And I'd like to take that idea and, and, and tweak it a little bit and say, I think it's as, as product designers and engineers, sometimes it's our job to change how people feel about something. What I've got here is a different way to visualize that exact same pipeline. If you've ever used FigJam, um, it has a very similar vibe. So you can zoom in and out 
You can hold space and you can drag things around. Um, and you can also drag these boxes around, uh, which is kind of cool. So you can drag this around, drag this around, put this over here, put that over here. Um, and so I think with this sort of layout, I think we can give you tools to tell better stories in your pipelines. Or, or show, I should uh, disclaimer to all this, this is not necessarily gonna make its way into the product. Um, in fact, this code is open source and we'll put the link to it in the, the, the chat. Uh, uh, but uh, this is just me having a play with what could feel like a different pipeline, just exploring some ideas. And just like how dynamic pipelines were born out of trying to solve the problem as config as code, I'm wondering what will be come out of this this work and this play. So this is an interesting way to, to visualize uh, uh, pipelines. Um, uh, and I've got some controls down here that I've, I've added. Um, if I click this one here and click some other thing I, uh, on, on the canvas, I can add these little sections uh, and I can sort of drag and drop things and uh, draw boxes around stuff. Because I said earlier, I think and humans think in terms of shapes and colors and lines. Um, I think we're sort of very visual creatures. Uh, can we give you some new tools to add some more visualization to the pipelines? Um, because what I find for what it's worth, I feel like computers are pretty dumb at laying things out. Uh, um, this particular layout was done by an algorithm to look at the order of which things should run and then try to slice and dice them and arrange them correctly, but it doesn't always get it right. And in fact, uh, uh, here is another, if I take this example um, uh, and I lay it out a little bit differently, you can see, hey, here we go. Uh, here is the same example, but laid out with sections and some images. And you can see my friend Chuck. Hey Chuck, uh, that's not me doing this. Um, in this example that I have, um, I've added multiplayer support to the pipeline. So two people, three or four, 10 people can be working and looking and arranging the same pipeline as once. I haven't quite, I don't know where this is gonna lead just yet. Maybe there's a way for you to define images and media in your pipeline.yaml file. Um, and have that somehow appear in this thing. Like maybe you can set X and Y coordinates in a pipeline.yaml format. I'm not entirely sure, but it's interesting to think about. Here is another example of a build uh, uh, pipeline that computers just get wrong. Uh, laying things out for a computer is difficult. But here, this is a this is a pipeline straight out of BuildKite. Um, I believe this is a, a, a build from an open source project. Uh, I think it's Rails actually. Um, and this is the dependency. This is how it actually looks. You can zoom in and get an idea of things, but uh, there's so many lines floating around um, and it's a little bit difficult to, to see and grok. But with tools, maybe we can allow you to lay things out a little bit differently. You can put things next to each other that make sense and you can drag um, boxes around things, um, you know, little pictures floating around, you know? I think that could be kind of cool, a kind of cool thing to think about. This particular set of code is, is open source. I've open sourced the whole thing. It's written in JavaScript and Next.js. And the point of this thing was to not have a point at all, <laughs> really. The point was just to have fun with programming um, and have fun with building something. Uh, and uh, when I was throwing these ideas around internally, everyone was like, ooh, what if it did this? What if it did that? Um, uh, and I think that's where great ideas come from, just this, this playing with the things that you build, like Lego as a kid, you know, you just put things together and it was, everyone always makes a spaceship. I don't know about you, but I always made a spaceship with Lego. This is my, me building like a spaceship or something. I don't know, but I have a lot of fun. I've been thinking about something else recently. Uh, so this is about visualizing pipelines. And I've also been thinking about uh, uh, what defining a pipeline could look like in the future. And let me show you what I think. You've all seen this before. This is uh, a pipeline.yaml format that we have. This is using the dependency syntax. So it depends on, um, we have an RSpec thing and then a bunch of linting and the linting depends on the um, RSpec thing running first. Talking a lot about dynamic pipelines and it's kind of interesting to think about the fact that we have a static configuration format to define a dynamic pipeline. Static config file, dynamic pipeline. Those things don't really match up particularly well. Uh, and so I've been thinking about what other formats are there uh, for, f that we could use to define a pipeline in. We've seen people define their own pipelines in their own programming languages, which is great. I've seen um, there's uh, there's uh, projects out there that let you define pipelines in, in Ruby and Golang and, and Bash, um, whole, a whole range of different 
ways to do it. But I thought, what could we build into the agent to make this easier? And so I've been thinking a lot about what would a pipeline look like if we were to define it in JavaScript. And so I'm wondering, would pipelines be better or worse if you define them in uh, JavaScript? And again, like dynamic pipelines, I don't know if this is actually gonna make its way into the agent, but I'd love to talk about it. I'd love to see what we think and, and see what we can, what can we, what can we discover by looking at this stuff together? So pipeline animal format, what I've done here is I've just wholesale taken it and moved it to JavaScript. Is it better? Uh, I don't actually know. Uh, I think it's basically the same, same really. There's a, certainly more curly brackets. Um, there's more non A to Z characters. There's just more structure. Um, I don't know, but there's less, you don't have to worry about spaces anymore, I'm trying to get the indentation right. So that's something. Um, but uh, I don't think the power of defining your pipelines in JavaScript comes into play in, in, until you start wrapping functions around it. What we could do if we define them as JavaScript is start taking common patterns and creating variables. Um, and here I'm, I'm, I'm defining a plugin, I'm defining two plugins um, and uh, uh, I'm referencing them later on in uh, the pipeline format file. So that's kind of interesting. That cleans things up a little bit. So if you then want to uh, update the version of Docker or use a different image, you only have to change it in one spot. Now in YAML, you can do that now with the YAML anchors, but it's clunky and I bet most people don't even know that YAML anchors exist. What if we had this concept of higher level commands? So you could define your own command and then um, here I've like defined a Docker uh, a Docker command that just does the plugin stuff um, automatically. Uh, uh, and I've used it at the bottom there. And this has actually cleaned up the pipeline quite a bit now. Um, it's programmatic, it's dynamic, and I can then change the Docker version at the top and everything will just sort of work. And that's kind of cool. I think even cooler is if you take that command and then put it in some shared internal library. And over time, you can then build this library of commands that you've used um, across uh, all your different pipelines. Or imagine if BillKite had a, a library of these things you could just pull from. I bet there's a lot of repetition across all the commands of all the pipelines across all of BillKite. So maybe we can offer some sort of shared library um, for that. Um, there could be a great story in here around governance as well. If you wanna lock down how Docker is run internally, maybe you could define your own internal library and then uh, stop people from writing commands directly, but instead use these pre-baked pre ones that you've built. That could be kind of cool. One other cool feature that I was thinking about if you were to define your pipelines as JavaScript is this idea of maybe having a middleware or a transformer. Let's say that you wanted to force the priority for every command step that was uploaded. We could do that at the back end. We could build a bunch of features on, in the BillKite agent API to force a priority, or we could do it at the agent level in the pipeline format. Um, so here what I've done is I've created this, this class that will change the priority of any command step that passes through it. And here the uh, go format step and the go build step would have its priority changed to five. Um, now imagine if you had, uh, this is just a contrived example, just to sort of demonstrate how it could work. Um, but I think there's something powerful here. Like there might be some governance thing or some security stuff that you need to force across every command. Um, it could be interesting to, to, to push through here and, and, and see what leads. Another cool aspect of, of defining your pipelines as JavaScript is that it makes common tasks quite easy. At this top, at the top here, I am um, uh, creating a, a pipeline that runs tests based on a bunch of directories in the folder. And this is ripped straight from our documentation. Now that whole, uh, actually, if, if you know Bash, that, that top example is prone to errors if there's like weird characters and double quoting, uh, it's, it's not particularly a safe operation and it generates YAML through string and manipulation and it's not overly robust, it's quite fragile. But in a JavaScript world, it becomes quite easy. You can just uh, shell out and then do a split and then create these command steps. That's kind of an interesting approach to making dynamic pipelines more interesting. And because we have a whole programming language at our disposal, we could do API calls. What if uh, the pipeline format could talk directly to our GraphQL API uh, uh, and we could handle all the authentication and key exchange for you so you don't have to worry about it. You can just say, hey, I need, give me the metadata from the last build that was run and then use that information to construct a pipeline. I think that's kind of interesting. For this all to work, we would need a JavaScript interpreter inside the agent. Um, 
Uh, and lucky for us, there are plenty of ways to do that. Um, there are plenty of open source tools that lets us, uh, the agent is written in Golang, and so we did a bit of Googling. Yeah, we can find a JavaScript interpreter written in Go. We can shove it in the agent and see how it goes. And if we, we have a JavaScript interpreter inside the agent, maybe plugins can move to JavaScript as well. One of the problems that we have with plugins now is that you have to write them in Bash and or, or have some other language that you then compile down so it's cross-platform and then have Bash or PowerShell scripts for Windows that call out to those compiled programs. It's a real pain. No one likes doing it. Um, uh, and I'm not sure if you've written Bash lately, but uh, it's uh, not fun. It's not fun. Uh, and so here is uh, a copy of our um, a Golang plugin, uh, it's written in Bash. Let's take a look at a JavaScript version. I think this makes a lot more sense um, uh, uh, and it's, it could be much more safer and we can provide a, a way cleaner API to, to run plugins um, instead of just relying on Bash and, and, and environment variables. And if we move away from Bash, that means that the agent can be less reliant on Bash as well, um, uh, uh, which is I think always a good thing. So we can just have less dependencies in the agent. I've kind of been obsessed with this idea a little bit and uh, we spoke about it internally and we took a crack at building it and we sort of have something working. If you head over to, um, we'll put the link in the chat, but if you head over to our GitHub um, agent uh, repo and look through the pull requests, you'll see this embedded JavaScript pipeline POC. One of our engineers, Paul, uh, took a crack at adding it and he got it working. Uh, and it's been kind of fun to play with. Uh, it's very limited at the minute. Um, uh, it doesn't do all the things that I just showed you. A lot of that was pseudocode, just exploring the ideas. Um, but uh, I'm interested to see how this thing plays out. We're gonna keep talking about it. I'd love to hear what you think about it. Uh, and so I'll drop my email address in the chat. Um, if you've got any ideas about how this could play out, if you, if you love it or you hate it, uh, uh, I, I want to hear it all. I want to hear all, everything you think about it. Thanks for uh, listening to me sort of t talk at you for a good 15 minutes about some some probably boneheaded ideas that I have around uh, defining pipelines and visualizing pipelines. But I assure you that the <laughs> the rest of the speakers at Unblock have some uh, some amazing things to talk about way more intelligently than, than I have. We've got people from Twilio, Uber, Retool, Cash App, a bunch of places talking about a bunch of awesome stuff. I think you're going to learn uh, quite a bit at this year's Unblock. Uh, I, for one, I'm really excited to see these talks. And with that, I'm going to hand it back to our hosts um, to to carry on with the show. Um, thanks, everyone, uh, again, and uh, have a great Unblock. I'll see you next time.